It says you are live. So, hi, this is Janos. It's Real World Audio. And I am testing out this new camera here. It's a temporary thing, but why not? Let's give it a, a test. And uh, I always do my videos, sort of this uh, impromptu ad, ad lib thing. Uh, my videos are not scripted. They are totally off the cuff all the time. And uh, even when I have those, when, when I have uh, PowerPoints for, uh, for the, the background, I usually just work on those PowerPoints whenever I have time. And, and often I make the video like a month after I made those slides. So I really just vaguely remember <laughs> what I wanted to talk about. And they just serve more as a, a background for you than anything scripted. So you often will notice that that when there's a slide in the background, I'm talking about something else. <laughs> so back here, so, oh, hi, 29. So actually, this is just for you today because I'm going to talk about uh, winding your own output transformers. So this will be some uh, background basic lessons uh, for, for that purpose. And... Uh, before I start that, I'm going to share one of uh, Frank's comments on output transformers, and let's see if this works. I'm trying to press an Alt tab to the other window. I hope you can still see me, because now I cannot see what's streaming and what's not. And Frank has posted about the aging of output transformers, and he wrote that Every 10 years, an excellent output transformer will gain in quality as the copper windings gradually distress in time. This is good to know and still unknown to many. And uh, this is something really, really important. I'm just switching back my, my view mode here. Uh, so I see that things are still going around. <laughs> and. Uh, and and that that's something that I have observed as well. That uh, and and it's 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 a, a fact of metallurgy and physics that once you uh, create a wire, once you wind a, a thin metal wire, then there's a lot of stress introduced at the at the atomic level uh, on the on the structure. And also, when you wind it into a transformer, there's also like creating a lot of stress, breaking a lot of those uh, internal uh, domain structures, breaking them up, breaking them up. And once you let your transformer sit, then the metal will recover from this stress. And it's just amazing that with the passage of time, how big uh, a difference this makes. And we don't notice that really because we, we usually just buy a transformer and then, you know, put it in after a week, after a month, after a year. And, and during that time, there's not much changing. But when we think about a, a scale of a decade of 10 years, a lot changes in 10 years. And, uh, and I can tell that because uh, I had a master output transformer binder wind me my uh, AVCs, my volume control transformers or autoformers, which is a specialty transformer. And, uh, and he asked me, what type of wire do I want uh, him to use? And, and he had all sorts of wire. And I asked him, uh, Danish, uh, what's, what's, What's your recommendation? Which is it that you want? And he, he said that he has this antique Turkish copper wire that's, uh, that at that time was already 50 plus years old. So now it's 70 years old now because that was 20 years ago. So basically the wire in my AVC unit that was drawn 70 years ago. So first, it had 50 years sitting in a barrel, recovering from the stress of winding it from, from a piece of molten metal. And then Danish Ba wound it, that in created stress. Uh, uh, could, could I share my contact? Actually, no, because I lost contact with him. Uh, 
I, I did not have his direct contact. Uh, it, it went through a friend of mine who was in Hungary, who was his close friend, and then he he moved from Hungary. And I think Danish Ba, I don't think he, he wants Transformers anymore because he was pretty old at that time when he won my Transformers. So now he would be, I think, in his 80s maybe. Uh, so not... I think he doesn't mind anymore. Um, so so that that's something kind of sad, yeah, to see the old masters go. and uh, but but it's a good thing that like what you can learn from them, me too. I'm just trying to just uh, transmit it. <laughs> so this was one thing that I learned from him to use antique wire. and he said that he has, like uh, OFC copper of many, many uh, 9999, you know, like 5N or 6N, 7, 8, whatever. And uh, those command astronomical prices. But his private opinion was that this antique Turkish wire there just beats the pants off the modern, freshly wound many N coppers. And he says just they, their naturality, the naturality of tone of an antique wire is just uh, quite far beyond that that's produced today. And, and even though which is produced today has uh, many and purity, but it still has to recover that tremendous stress of being drawn onto a wire. And um, I found that that when I'm comparing uh, that AVC to units that, that have freshly wound copper on them, they, they sound much more mechanical. And that's because of the age of the wire. So when you are sourcing wire for your transformer, then don't be afraid to look for uh, sources which sell like surplus wire. We have some like leftover, like 10 pounds or 10 kilos of uh, magnet wire, uh, something like World War II era or something like really shady like that. And no, something that no one really wants. There's no market for that. If you find it, grab it because that's that's uh, that might be your ticket for an outstanding transformer so so that's that's one tip that i wanted to share based on uh, frank's uh, comment that i just saw now and uh, and that's one thing so if you are trying to like find like really high quality wire that doesn't cost an arm and a leg if you can source this because you would be able to source this antique wire not in a big quantity uh, like today that transformer winders use because uh, 20 years ago i was playing around with the idea to make my own output transformers and i started embarking on the project i, I bought a turns counter for me i started building my own jig to, to wind the transformer so that with every turn it counts. The, the counter goes up one tick, 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 because you have to be able to count the turns and you have to be able to count at the order of 10,000 turns. So you will need to like crank it like 10,000 times or more per transformer. So it, it's quite a bit of uh, time consuming. And, uh, and of course you see people just we're just hooking it up to a drill or something automatic. It can be done like that, but then you have, do not have a fine control on uh, on how you wind it. And if you want to have an automatized automatic unit that 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 has control over like the tension of the wire, uh, what is the uh, the tightness, how how it is wound perfectly, then that machine will cost you like the price of a hundred output transformers and, 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 and you can only afford it once you have a successful company. And, and, and if, when you are, we want to build your output transformer because you can't afford a, a, an expensive uh, dedicated output transformer, that's totally off of the, the plans. So what I recommend if you want to, to wind for yourself a high quality output transformer, you have to build your winding jig for yourself and 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 turn count the turns one by one and and uh, and that's important because as as you make the turns you have to make sure that you are tensioning the wire 
for the same tension throughout all the turns, throughout all the layer. So it cannot have slack and then too tight, because if you do that, you will create all sorts of resonance problems. Uh, and that, that's the recipe for, for disaster for having transformers with, with, really, with oddities in it and high frequency problems and, and just like noises or maybe like rattling or something like really, really bad. And um, so, so basically for the winding part, I recommend to build a jig and with a manual counter, that will be your safest ticket. It will take you very long time to uh, wind a transformer like that. But I can tell you that is how the most expensive top of the line transformers with audio note and condo are wound. They are wound by hand. So the guys are like counting it and, and making sure that the tension is there. But it's not the beginners who are winding it, but the most experienced guys are winding. And that's because they know how to tension it, how how tight the, the individual coils will be next to each other. But I would say like this is kind of like the final lesson to it, but I want to throw it out now so you are prepared for that. And you do, don't do something stupid like hook it up to a drill and pfft, let it fly and you lose count and you just get totally random stuff that and you if you just use a drill you won't be able to uh, to replicate a transformer so each of the units will be different uh, so going back uh, more to the basics so these are just a few technical considerations so one was that sourcing the wire uh, you can buy on, what i did myself i bought online on ebay magnet wire it's called magnet wire so this is enameled copper wire and and you can buy it by like five pounds ten pounds so like really big amount so it will cost a lot but you will get enough to wind uh, quite a few output transformers so that's why because it's it's so uh, heavy and costs so much and and you are getting amounts for like a dozen output transformers do not buy it in the beginning. So buy the wire when you are ready, when you have done all the calculations. The most important part is first do your calculations, like how many turns you need and everything there. And what is the wire gauge that you need for the primary, for the secondary. And once you have everything down and you have calculated that it fits in, in, on, in the windows of your output transformer, only then buy the wires because uh, for each build the gauges you need will be different and and i made that mistake that uh, uh, that i bought a bunch of different gauges actually it was not a mistake i did a lot of calculations and 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 i uh, and i made designs for myself for a couple of different uh, power transformer filament transformer choke output transformer and bought the gauges according to that but when I was at that point to finally like uh, build that specific output transformer, I realized that when I redid the calculations, I still did not have <laughs> the all the gauges that, that I, I really need for the project. So that's why don't be too hasty. And, uh, and if you see that, oh, someone is offering like 20 pounds of gauge 28 magnet wire for really cheap, maybe you can buy it and 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 have it as as part of the project but maybe you will need gauge 26 or 30 for your build and it's like you have all that wire uh but that the lesson in that is that if you decide to wind your own output transformer also be prepared that you will be winding your own power transformers and chokes and filament transformers and 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 then all that magnet wire that you have in stock that will be put to good use and also much more important than that is that you have to start by winding a choke first uh, because that's the easiest then you need to make a single coil and first the big challenge for you will be how to calculate <laughs> a single coil properly and how to just wind it and make sure that it doesn't rattle it works the voltage installation is there and, and you are able to stack the laminations and 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 so on and gap for the current and and that's your basic learning experience and once you roll out a couple of chokes and and they work 
now you are ready to go to the next step and wind a filament transformer. So then you have like a choke, but you are adding a secondary coil to that. And, and for a filament transformer, the easy thing is to uh, just to add one coil extra and because there is no need for interleaving because for filament transformer, you only have the low frequency, like 50 or 60 hertz. And for that, you don't need to interleave the coils. So it's like the easiest experience. And I get um, uh, a, a question, what do you need to know to calculate the wire? Now, today, I'm not going to talk about that because that's really, that's a semester long subject. And and what I, uh, I, I will talk next time on it, but I need some preparations and and I need to get something more fundamental than a, than a notebook and my chicken scratch on it. Uh, what you need to do is um, look resources, look at the mathematics because the calculations is really easy. It's all about mathematics and it's available online and you can read it. And and you have to read it for yourself, understand it, memorize it, and then you can do calculations. There are a lot of online calculators as well. So that's the easy part. Uh, what I want to focus on in, in this talk and in the series, I will probably in this episode today, I will be just able to share a few things. Uh, what I want to share is what you need to know on top of what you can find online. So this is the uh, advanced stuff. But it's basic as well, because like, for example, that advice I gave on how you buy your wire, buy it after you've done the calculations. And um, that's one aspect. The other aspect is the lamination itself. So that's where I had a dead stop with all my transfer winding projects, because uh, it's almost impossible to get to buy uh laminations in a small enough quantity to to uh, to wind a few transformers when you when you contact companies who make who produce transformer laminations they will sell it to you by the pallet so uh, so you really need to buy enough laminations to make at least 100 transformers so if you can like pay out like 10,000 20,000 dollars for the laminations, that's when you can buy uh, enough lamps for, for transformers to wind for yourself. But you don't want to make that jump unless you are already a, a very good transformer winder and you have a reputation and you have a bunch of clients who are ready to buy a hundred pair of units from you. Otherwise you will be spending like a car's worth of money and, and you will have like uh, hundreds of transformers that, that you wind like with a, with a whole year's work, continuous work of winding them. And, uh, and how are you going to make a living? Yeah? So uh, that's where I stopped, that, that you cannot buy high quality laminations in small quantities. And if you can source them in small enough quantities, they will come at such a premium price that if you buy a, a, a made, ready-made transformer like a Lundal or a Hashimoto, that will be about the same price as buying just the lamination for it. So it doesn't make sense of just getting a few lamps because it, it will be too expensive for a pair of transformers. So what you can do as, as a beginner transformer winder is uh, microwaves. So, so look for discarded microwaves and microwaves have like really big, like uh, 200, 300 watt core uh, power transformers and just uh, file off the, uh, the coils from, from them and take out the lamination. So you li literally have to just uh, remove them lamination by lamination. And it's not easy because they, they are baked together, they are enamel together, and, uh, and you will ruin quite a bit of the laminations when you try to separate them. You will need a very sharp metallic knife to wedge between the lamps 
and it's a nightmare. I started doing that. I broke off the first five lambs and okay, screw it. I'm, I'm not doing with this. But if you might have bigger patience and you can succeed with that, and if you do, that's like a wonderful size to make your output transformers. And uh, like that size core can give you like a 30 watts uh, uh, output single-ended output transformer. And, and uh, of course, like a microwave uh, laminations, those are not the, the finest that you can get. It's, it's not like, uh, like, like an M6 silicon steel or something like that. It's not that high grade as that's used in output transformers. But what it can do is that uh, the difference, main difference is that it will give you the bulk uh, magnetizable uh, uh, particle content inside. So you will get the wattage and the brute row power. You will have that, that, that uh, really big sound, effortless, uh, lack of clipping uh, that you probably will never experience if you are using small output transformers that just are barely sufficient for the application. Uh, so the first time I realized this, how important this is, when I got the my big ad core output transformers for my flea power amp. So they are 30 watt uh, single-ended cores and they are about the size of a microwave power transformer. And I'm using them for about a one watt peak output power. And I just noticed that, geez, I'm, I'm having such uh, dynamics with it, such headroom that I never heard from any, any commercial amplifier, even like 60 watt push-pull amps, everything. And then I realized, okay, there's like a ton of transformer clipping going on. And one thing to avoid it is to get, uh, hi, Eddie, welcome, um, uh, is to get like a really, really big core that's just massively oversized for your project. And then you will never hit transformer saturation. And that will be such a life and game changer. And when people say that you all read in, in the solid state forums that I hate tubes because they use transformers and such a limitation because it limits their dynamics. Yes, it limits the dynamics when it's oversized, when you have enough dynamic, in, enough uh, mm, headroom, enough wattage headroom for your output transformer, then that thing never comes up. And then it's quite a bit superior to, uh, to a similar solid state application without an output transformer because you have that uh, dynamic headroom, plus you also have the impedance matching ability of the transformer, which a solid state device, when it doesn't have an output transformer, it lacks. So even though solid states are capable of driving loudspeakers without an output transformer, but they all still benefit from impedance matching. So if you impedance match a solid state uh, unit, you will still have far superior uh, naturality and uh, uh, and a lot of the high frequency nasties will be gone. So where was I? I started my thoughts from somewhere and I got lost. So I think I started out by using that big core for, uh, for your output transformer project, either single-ended or push-pull, it will work fine. The compromise that you will uh, have for using a microwave transformer is it will not have uh, that fine low level uh, resolution as, as a dedicated uh, output transformer has that, that uses really high quality laminations because uh, the domains that form in it are relatively crude. And uh, so they, they are not, not responsive enough to, to really low level signals. They, they can't transmit that information uh, so the core is insufficient for that. But where it's sufficient is the large scale. It will be able to give you uh, much more than uh, even high quality transformers could because it's not because they are high quality, but because they are just barely sized for the uh, application. So when you buy a, a, a tube amplifier that's rated for 60 watts, 
then in 99% of the cases, they sell it with an output transformer that's also rated at 60 watts. They should rate the output transformer way higher to avoid transformer clipping, but they don't because the cost will increase exponentially with bigger iron. However, for yourself, you can mind that uh, output transformer on that microwave uh, lamination and, and you can avoid that limitation. Also, second consideration is interleaving. So that means that uh, when you have a coil for your primary, uh, then you need your secondary coil. Uh, so the primary is connected to the tube's output, so it's between the high voltage supply and your tube's plate, and the secondary connects to the two wires of your voice coil, if it's a, a full range driver or the two wires running to the crossover network. So basically, that's the speaker connector there. And, and if you have one coil for the primary and one coil for the secondary, then what it will do is that the low frequencies will be coupled between them. So it means the low frequencies will be transmitted from the primary to the secondary. But as the frequency goes higher, mm, you'll have problem. So above the mid-range, you will have like the frequency uh, transmission ability, like really, really uh, going down. And at 10 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz, you won't hear anything. So that's why you have to interleave. And, uh, and uh, how you do that is that you start winding your primary. You want, let's say, your total primary count is 10,000 turns. So instead of winding 10,000 turns, and then your secondary maybe 100 turns, and then, and then making a second coil with 100 turns, instead of that, you make uh, the primary two coils, one 5,000 and another 5,000. And when you wind the first that 5,000 turns, and then you put insulation over that, and then you wind your secondary, those 100 turns, insulation over that, and then you wind the second 5,000 turns. So that's a two to one interleaving. So it means that there's two layers of primary, and one layer of secondary sandwiched in between. Now that's a little bit better, but it still won't give you a, a wide enough frequency range to, to get you the, the high highs above like 15 kilohertz or so. So what I would uh, suggest is that when you are ready to roll out your output transformer is the 3-2 interleaving. So break up your primary coil into three coils and break up the secondary into two and sandwich in between. So you will have five coils total. And now that's quite a challenge for a beginner project. And, and I think now you understand why you have to start with just a choke, which is just a single coil, because uh, there's uh, you will have to learn a lot of things like how to wind the winding properly, uh, etc. How to use the jig, whatnot. How to do the calculations, uh, how, uh, and so on. And and the three to two interleaving that will give you enough frequency uh, extension to go at least to like uh, 15, 16, 17 kilohertz, and uh, that will be good enough for you to enjoy on most audio systems. It won't be as good as a Hashimoto, sure. But uh, those guys at Hashimoto, they've been winding output transformers for a lifetime. And, and, and each, each of them who wind them and design them, they have designed hundreds, thousands of transformers and wound tens of thousands. So, and that's why they are so darn good with it. Because everything that you do during the winding matters. And the most important thing when you start out is just start with a choke and, and write down every tiny detail. Keep a, a, a notebook, electronic or paper, you, it's your choice, but write down every tiny little detail, like how tight the winding is, how many uh, uh, coils are for the first uh, layer and then second layer, 
how do you build the layers uh, uh, and then when you put insulation on it how tight you wind it what sort of insulation it is uh, for insulation material, there is a transformer paper that, that you can buy that's, uh, that that uh, that is basically like a kind of looks like waxy paper uh, that that you put things bobbin. You have to be uh, have to wind your bobbin. So that's a, a structure that uh, that houses the coils. And then you can stack the laminations through the bobbin, and um, and and between each of these coils that you are interleaving, you put insulation, and and read the description of that paper, and that's why you need to buy transformer paper because they do give you the voltage insulation, that per layer, how many volts, like 500 volts or 200 volts or how many is the installation is and if you want to have like higher installation rating then you need to add multiple layers of paper and when you add multiple layers then you need to make sure that how tight you 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 wind that paper onto the magnet it needs to sit there firmly it should not make like crumply sounds resonances and when you are winding your coil so it, there's nothing loose, there's nothing rattling. Uh, what uh, what you could do, uh, you you. So one more thing, when you make a coil, of course after that you will have wire hanging out. You have to just make it, make sure that winding the ends don't get uh, mixed up. You have to put labels like sticky notes at the end of the wires that we, this was like the uh, the beginning of the primary core and this this wire is the end of the primary core you must not switch the two up you have to know which was the end that you started winding and that was the end that was the end of the coil because you need to connect all coils with the same orientation so like the here's the uh, uh, the initial wire that you started to wind the coil with, and that was the end. That's the first coil. So now the second one, you you connect the end to the beginning, and and end to the beginning, end to the beginning, because if you connect one coil in reverse, then you will have the reverse inductance, and 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 that will not work. Uh, then the coils will cancel each other, and you must avoid that. And uh, Rick says there's a winder from Bulgaria. His works look impressive. His company is called Muse Coils. Ah, thank you for the tip. And uh, and what I, I can recommend, Rick, and for everyone, based on Rick's recommendation, if you know uh, transformer winders and companies, just look up, look them up, look up their web pages, what sort of information they have. If they have like a long history, or or, or they they really enjoy what they're doing, they share some tips and tricks on their websites. So when you go, for example, to Hashimoto's website, they have a lot of insider information on what they do with their transformers, uh, some things about uh, about winding uh, things. I mean transformers and. Uh, when then we go to that level like Hashimoto level then it becomes like totally nuts uh, and it's like uh, uh, you add like first like a shielding that that's a shielding between uh, the uh, the the laminations between the core and your bobbin like shielding between uh, the individual coils adding like a, a, an outer mu metal layer to uh, to shield so all kinds of weird things and and plus when you are at that level to find the master transformer, then you can go up to like really high interleavings, like uh, uh, four to five interleaving or even like seven to six. So basically you partition the primary coil to seven coils and you have six secondaries sandwiched in between. And generally what you want to do is to sandwich the secondaries in between the primaries because you would think that maybe I have like 
three primaries and then four secondaries. And, and the thought for that, for a beginner, is that it's much easier to break the secondary coil into multiple bits because it's just so few coils. It's, it's, it's much very easy, very practical. But then the outer layers would be outside the coil window. So basically, they would be the innermost and outermost coils. And on the other side, there is nothing to aid them. And, and they will be much more subject to uh, high frequency uh, EMF radiation coming from the outside to pick up that. And when they are sandwiched in between the primary coils, that big coil is the main driver for the high frequency response in the secondary. And, um, uh, and also uh, what makes a really big difference is how is the order that you connect up the uh, coils, the primary and the secondary, because you are not connecting one, two, three, four, and one, two, three here. If you connect them this order, that's not the best you are going to get. The leakage, leakage inductances will be quite high and frequency response not so good. And you need to have like uh, different orders. I cannot give too much pointers on that, except that maybe like have the Outermost layers connect this to that, and then that, that, and that's the order. And similar thing for secondary, start with, with the center, uh, one on the one side and one on the other side. I connect them in this order. And, uh, and also, when you want to design an output transformer with multiple secondary taps, it becomes much, much more difficult because then you have to also take into account the ratios, uh, the proper coil ratio to have the actual impedance that you want, like the four ohm, eight ohm, 16 ohm impedances. And, and you also have to take into account the order they are connected. And then you will notice that uh, if you want multiple taps, the, the mathematics and, and, and how you want to contact them, connect them, it, it's not suitable to give you really high quality uh, output for all of the taps. And, and that's why some companies like Adcore, they just give you a single output tap. And, and uh, even if other companies like Hashimoto, they have multiple output taps, but if you have, if they wind you a specific one with only one output tap, that single output tap will be higher quality compared to an iron that has uh, multiple, that is designed with multiple taps in mind. So I think uh, that's uh, my, that's the gist of my uh, transformer, transformer winding primer for today. And uh, next time I want to share about uh, how do we get to approach the calculations. So some basics on, on inductance, on understanding inductance and what it really takes uh, to, to calculate it and, and how we change things, how does that affect the inductance and what is the amount of inductance that you need for an output transformer. And uh, that, that there's quite a lot to it. And, and that's why if you are really serious on building an output transformer, winding it for yourself, first wind the choke because that's already a big challenge. And if you made a good choke, then you are ready to make a good filament transformer. And then you can try uh, an output transformer after that. But uh, if you just first just build, try to build an output transformer, there's next to zero chance that you will succeed if you never even try to build a choke. So that's why I like take step by step. So before you want to do summer sorts in the air, first you need to be need to learn how to stand up. If you don't even know how to stand up, there's zero chance to do summer sorts. First you need to stand up, then you need to learn how to walk around, how to run, basic balance skills, anything, and then output transformer. So thank you for tuning in and thank you for for your comments and questions. And oh, I got here a, a question about uh, name systems. Uh, uh, this 
actually now this is the live feed but and i wanted to really make it about uh, transformer winding uh, this is uh, like a different question and uh, i have heard name a long time ago and uh, i don't know i have to say something uh, I, I, I get a lot of questions like what type of gear did I hear before? And, and what I can tell you guys is I, I have heard a, an incredible range of, of gear, like like really crazy amount of gear. But I, I have a, a very wacko attitude of listening to gear. And that wacko attitude is that I block, like completely block out, black out the name of the equipment, what model it is, everything when I listen, because I don't want any preconceptions to interfere with what how, what I'm hearing from the sound. Uh, so when I stick in front of a gear, I have zero care of what the name of the company is, zero care of what the price range is. I don't make any assumptions based on whether it's, it's a $200 system in front of me, Maybe we cannot call it even a system, but maybe let's call it maybe a soundbar or something, or met, or maybe the parts cost a million dollars or more. I don't care. Uh, to me, I just block out every information. And once I hear something interesting in the sound, or I thought, oh, I think this is special, there is more to it than uh, what I'm used to, then I look and, and memorize what the name is, and memorize what the model is and then i research it and 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 try to figure out what makes it special so so name belongs to that category that i heard a, a couple systems before but it did not stick i can't even recall which experience was it because uh, it did not leave a, a lasting impression in me and uh, don't think that that uh, that's so bad for, uh, for any any system that that you like or that you love because uh, I had that extremely special situation that uh, basically I was living in my mentor's uh, audio store and and heard everything that he toyed around with the, the systems he put together. And, and when he put together audio systems, he, he, in his store, you did not hear what you heard anywhere else in the world because he modified everything. And his mods took like gear, like two, three, four, five steps higher than what they were. And when you put a complete system together like that, it's just a totally different level. And even if I say like he had like a Conrad Johnson or Quicksilver and Wondersteins and he used Kimber cables and harmonic tech cables, things like that. But that still doesn't even begin to cover the story because you uh, know people who visited his store and, and, and he had like the exact same equipment that, that they hear on the mainland in San Francisco or, or New York, wherever. And they were just shocked and blown away because this, what they heard there didn't even resemble what they are used to. It's like a totally different sound. And like Stu's small room where he had his introductory level gear, even the sound there, what was the level of his gear? It, there, like the average price of uh, each component was like 500 to to $1,000 per speaker or amp and uh, CD player. Or, or turntable, like something like really cheap in the cheap range. But even his small room, the sound quality you got there when you listen to. Uh, so I was listening to that for like a couple of years, you know, learning, blah, blah, blah. And then I uh, traveled over to the mainland continental USA to San Francisco and uh, I went into stereo stores and listened to gear that had similar equipment, but much higher range models, like uh, five, 10 times, 50 times the price that was in Stu's small room. And it, the sound was junk. I couldn't believe my ears. Like, what's happening here? Why, why is the sound so crappy here? And, and this is why I have a little trouble relating my experiences with audio gear to you, because the format that I'm used to hearing them uh, as as a as a as a product, I think of them as the 
clay that needs to get severe molding to to get anything out of them so and it's basically at that level that this is true for every single company i cannot make name a single product that when you just buy and plug it in and and it gives me a result that i would allow it in my home and anything and everything i have is just severely modified and uh and that's why uh, that's why I made this channel because I want to share how I modify things, how you can do that if you uh, decide to do it. Because like you know, like audio gear, they cost a fortune. If you mess something up, you know, you have voided the warranty already. Boof, like a couple of thousand dollars out the window. So that's uh, and no one wants to do that, right? So that's why what I did. I, I didn't dare to do it either. So when I started, I didn't dare to like modify like a $5,000 speaker. I didn't even dare to screw a, a screw, a single screw out of it. Like oh, I avoid the warranty, you know, that's it. Uh, so that's why I decided I just start building stuff for myself. And if I screwed up, no big deal. It was, you know, a couple for a loudspeaker, a couple hundred dollars for the wood, a couple hundred dollars for the driver, a little wire, hook up wire on the inside, maybe fifty, a hundred dollars, not a biggie. And if I just puncture the woofer, I I replace it with another woofer, few hundred dollars, lesson learned. Next time I won't do that mistake again. But if I do that on a pair of loudspeaker that I paid ten thousand bucks for, <clears throat> poke through the driver, that's it. Uh, so. So that's why I started learning DIY because I I noticed that unless you modify something, you are getting maybe ten percent of the potential of that gear, and uh, and, and it's it's just really wasted money. So you pay ten thousand dollars for a system, and and maybe not even fifty percent of of the potential is usable for you, and. And although I, I have my idea that for me, which is a great system synergy, which is the path I want to travel to find that, that sound that I'm looking for, which is non-mechanical sound. So for me, uh, what my chief priority is that the sound that I'm hearing from the stereo should not have any mechanical quality to it. So it, it should not be like it's 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 uh, reprocessed or something or controlled or something fakery. If there's some fakery in the sound, that that really takes me out from the listening zone. And maybe it has great bass or great dynamics, but if there's fakery coming with it, then oh, uh, I can cannot connect to that. And you have to figure out all of you like how you can connect to the music and what is it that that you really want. And, and I noticed that this thing, like the lack of mechanical nature, this is a really fundamental aspect that, that many audiophiles, this is all of our deepest craving. And, and when you want like absolute bass or absolute dynamics, those are things that you are missing in your life and you want to build towards. But under that, all of us want this lack of mechanical quantity. And, uh, and with either like digital source or analog source, you can go towards there. If you go towards analog path, you will get there much faster and at a much lower price range compared to digital. But where you want to go, it depends on so many factors. One of them is your music listening preferences. If you listen to modern music, go digital. If you cannot source any vinyl, go digital. And um, I think now it's time to read some more comments. Groovesick is uh, commenting. I used to stream a lot, not using a good CD transport with my deck. Way more engaging. Any thoughts? Uh, so uh, now using a CD transport. So so now uh, you are saying that uh, CD transport is much more engaging versus streaming, right? That's your observation because uh, I have observed that so many times and so many, yes, okay, thank you. So I have feedback on this from uh, two of my good friends. One of them, you know, Irvin, 
he has posted on his uh, power conditioning. I mean, I posted his video that he made on his system, what is the power conditioning he uses. So he shared with me this experience that I'm going to relate to you. So he has a very expensive streaming system. And, and he that that's his primary source that he streams his music through there. And, uh, and, and as an experience, he decided to uh, swap in his old Harman Kardon uh, CD transport, CD player for, to you as a source instead of the streaming. And that was uh, like a really old player uh, that Stu modified for him. And, and he was shocked that that intro level modded player just absolutely, totally floored that hyper expensive streamer by such a margin, he was almost weeping. And uh, and uh, and usually, I would say that if you have a really good optimized uh, CD transport, uh, that that gives quite a bit on edge over streaming. However, you can make streaming work as well. And for that, the secret is uh, you have to be very very careful with the power conditioning. So you need uh, an excellent po power cord for the streamer. Uh, what I did myself, uh, I, I will share this, but also like there's real hi-fi help. And, and he is, uh, Larry of Hi-Fi Help, he's been sharing a lot of ideas about uh, how to have a streamer and, and work it really well. And, and it's kind of a, an interesting thing because when you read on uh, forums and everywhere, there's a lot of mentions that, that some people can make it work well. But... Uh, there's another mention, like my friend Rishi, uh, he's in Australia, and he has a bunch of audio buddies who have really, really high level uh, systems put together, and they, they get together for listening parties. And, and he, re he reports the same thing. When, when, when he puts his uh, transport and plays CDs, it just blows away the streamers. And then those guys, they, they rave about their streamers, but when A beat, with the transport, with the, with the CD source, even though they stream the high-res version of the file, the, the CD just floors everything, just sounds so much natural, so much more substance to it, so so better, and, and so much more coherent image. And uh, hey, hi, Klaus. Greeting, greetings to Norway. <laughs> uh, and uh, and that uh, that's, that's usually something that that i see as well that that from from the cd transport we get a more of a coherent nature more of a lowered mechanical level so even when people get the streaming almost optimized or get to a bestest level then there's still a lack of um, non-mechanical nature to it it still retains a level of mechanicality and and that's primary because uh, the streaming is just so sensitive to the line AC to the to the power because uh, th we have the uh, the Wi-Fi uh, and then the Wi-Fi is talking to your deck I mean to your streamer and the streamer to your deck so there is like a lot of very high frequency like gigahertz frequency uh, signals generated within each units and that gigahertz level signal uh, re, to, to stabilize it and to have the, the clock and everything work perfectly synchronized between all these three units, it requires absolutely clean power. And, and you notice that, that we, we use those crappy switch mode power supplies to, to feed your router, to feed the streamer. And when you buy like a, a very expensive, uh, switch mode power supply for a thousand dollars that makes a giant difference but go to the next step uh build uh, a, a brute force power supply for the streamer for the wi-fi that uses like uh choke input choke cap choke cap choke that brute filtering that that really uh, takes care much better of those nasties that would get into the Wi-Fi, that would get into the streamer, that would be get transmitted to your deck and create that, that unstability, that haze 
that, that will make the, the streamed sound um, lack that innermost integrity that you can get with, with, with a good CD source. Uh, so uh, Groove 6 says that streaming sounds boring in comparison, also glary. CD brings engagement, yeah. So, so that glariness, uh, that's that's the result of the the power issues streaming or or leaking or seeping into the signal, because we think that it's 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 digital ones and zeros, right? But no, it's not. So so the the next stage thinks that that signal that's coming it interprets it within the logic gate as a zero or a one, but it's traveling as a as a as basically as an analog signal as a voltage between zero volts and five volts. But uh, and and within that quanta that that the that the uh, that the receiver chip is receiving it. So within that that uh, microsecond or nanosecond or femtosecond, uh, it will have this uh, amount of voltage. Let's say like four point nine volts for one. But it it can have the other frequency ranges which are like much higher, like in the uh, gigahertz range or lower frequency range where all of the uh, noise that's getting through from your line AC that's riding in that's directly not affecting seemingly the logic gate's ability to flip to interpret it as, as a zero or as a one but on the analog side of your deck or, or each uh, then it will uh, add to the signal and transform that signal on those domains. And that's why it will have this, this haziness, this thing that, that, which is like that super high frequency noise uh, interacting with the audible level signal and basic, basically screwing up the high frequency transients in your audible uh, path, screwing up uh, feedback loops, uh, in your amplifier that you get later on and, and reacting with your uh, with the crossover in your loudspeaker. And uh, even though like the loudspeaker can transmit maybe like 25 kilohertz peaks, if you have like a nice uh, super tweeter, a nice extension tweeter on it, but, but the crossover, it will react to hundreds of kilohertz or a gigahertz frequency and, and will, that will kind of like jam the signal and create uh, like, ripples back into the audible uh, range. So I think uh, I kind of like uh, need some uh, fluids getting like <laughs> uh, parged. Uh, it's already almost an hour I've been speaking. So I think now I'm uh, going to close this session, but I forgot the most important part. I started talking about my system I have for streaming that I made to work really well. And the secret for that was number one, I put the, the, uh, the modem, the router uh, into a, a line conditioner. So it's a once evers, mic once evers conditioner that I souped up. It's, it's a modified once evers conditioner. And basically, it's sitting there. And I don't use Wi-Fi to connect uh, to the Blu-ray. I use the Blu-ray for for streaming, like Netflix and YouTube, and Pun and what what else? Amazon Prime. So that's the two three things I have on my Blu-ray. That's those are the ones I'm streaming digital sound information, and I have it directly hooked up with Ethernet cable. So I'm not using Wi-Fi, cutting the middleman out. If you can cut it out, you will save like a ton of hassle and uh, and a ton of noise that, that's electromagnetic noise that, that's introduced. So you can cut out the middleman, makes a big difference. Also, the, uh, the streamer, which is my Blu-ray player, that's also on a, on a light conditioner. Uh, Plus, it has like a really hardcore power cord. I just uh, hardwired gauge 10 power cord from there to the line conditioner. It's the Kimber PK10. 
that's that's the top of the line Kimber power conditioning cable. So I'm just using that heavy gauge wire to to feed the digital source, and that just mind blowingly opened up the uh, naturalness, the the palpability. So that that totally grounded the sound. Before that, it sounded like I, I did not even consider using it as 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 as, as like a, a, a listening experience. So before those those mods, uh, or and and putting them on line conditioners, I just used the CD player to listen to music. And since then, that I I did these things, line conditioners for them for both the modem and the uh, and the source, the Blu-ray, plus the really heavy gauge uh, power cord. And, and the same thing, the super heavy gauge power cord on the deck as well. On the deck, I also have gauge 10, but that one is, is, a, is a silver power cord, a DIY cord that I made. I have a video on that. That, that, that silver power cord just, that was a mind-blowingly complete transformation. And uh, that took the, the little PS audio deck to stratospheric heights. So when Paul McGowan, his PS audio, he says that this Digital Link 3 uh, DAC, which, which is a really old model now, and no one really takes it seriously. Even when, when it came out, he said that it's extremely sensitive to the power cord you use with. He, that was uh, not an overstatement. And, and when I just used that uh, crazy silver <laughs> cord on it, it, it just catapulted to such a stratospheric uh, height that um, it's as enjoyable to me. It has as much emotional content, as much solidity, stability as most analog systems I listen to at other places. Uh, and it's, it, it's kind of uncanny. So, so for all of you, my message is that you, if you love to listen to digital, uh, when you have a good CD transport, you have a better chance, much, much, much better chance to have a, a very deep, very enjoyable, very solid, uh, emotional, connective experience with that compared to streaming. But when you stream, take care of the power. Uh, what was the power that it gets? Like a better power supply, better uh, power conditioning, better power cord. It will make all sorts of difference, the day and night difference. Upgrading your streamer, upgrading the deck will not make as much difference. What that upgrade will do is that it will give you higher and higher resolution, but that emotionality, that palpability, it's not getting there. That will be when you fix the power issue. So uh, thank you guys for bearing with me. I hope this was an enjoyable hour for everyone and I'm ready to log out and uh, thank you please like and subscribe for those if you haven't and let me see how to log out this is my first try here i don't see oh i see there's a button called end stream and um have an awesome day now i had that thingy the button that says remember the live stream uh comments so they will be there once the stream is over so that's that's something really good so bye bye have a wonderful day